is that there isn't a single number that if you want fish, you want about 100 feet of buffer. If you want deer, you want 300 feet. If you want cougars, mountain lions, you want 600 feet. There is a gradation depending on what you want. Uh, if you have 100 foot of buffer starting at the high water line of the stream and a 65-10-0 standard and forced select logging pro uh, uh, protocol built in, I think you'll end up with more than 65 percent forest and my feeling is that that's probably as good as we can do in this Vale of Tears. Scott over there is looking like, oh, when I get holes out of here, I'm going to really drill it. <coughs> and if you have Later, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> As you know, it's very complex. It is complex. And it's hard to do. And, and what concerns me is that uh, the 6510, in order to beat the King County Court case, which declared the 65% tree ratio of tax, you have to demonstrate the nexus between the actual development going in and the effect on the stream. And to do that, you have to do some pretty intense hydrologic modeling that's specific to that stream reach and that watershed. That's where you're headed with your science to local policy. It costs a lot of money to get there, and you can only do it a few basins at a time. Once you get away from that very specific nexus, then the courts have said, that's a tax. You don't have the nexus. You can't require it. So it's, it's very difficult. What concerns me is, is I think doing this in the urban areas, I'm all in favor of. As you move out into the rural county, there's no biological model to suggest that once you start breaching those impervious surface levels and have forest cover requirements, that we can actually protect the stream that we need to, to the degree we need to. So me, to my way of view, and the long-term answer in the rural areas is don't let the density get out there to begin with. Mm -hmm. Keep it forested, keep it rural, uh, and then someday when there's a biologic model that's been tested over a period of time that shows you've actually achieved zero runoff and no change in stream temperature, no change in chemistry, then maybe you can relax some of the regulation out of the rural area. But in the rural area now, the only thing we know that works for sure is native forest and habitat. That's really the bottom line. So that's that's one of the concerns I have when we talk about LID, is people like the idea, they like the concept, and then they want to try it somewhere, but you're experimenting in watersheds that currently are forested and still intact. So experiment in the rural or the urban areas to use the restoration. So that's that's the Clark philosophy. Yeah, well, I think if Rich Horner heard you right now, he'd be tearing up because that's exactly his philosophy too. And I don't disagree. I mean, if we could drop the Iron Curtain and say we're going to have no more rural development, that is the ideal situation. In fact, I just saw a Puget Sound Partnership paper that came out, probably just hit their website, that said that in the Puget Sound Basin, we only have 58% of the original forest remaining. So we're Puget Sound wide anyhow, we're already below the mark. We can't get there from here. So uh, that reinforces what you're saying. We really ought to stop developing outside city boundaries. Well, and that the biggest change in a watershed, like your, your slide showed, is that initial forest cut. That's when the most damage occurs. So as soon as you make that first blade and grave where you've taken down the trees and bladed the site and you've compacted the soils, the damage is en route. So that's really the context in which you have to view this. Yeah, it's, it's hard. And all we can say is the data is telling us that if we can somehow stay above those parameters that those 20 years of data that Booth collected tell us that maybe we can skinny by. Right. And that's, but for that's sure, if we keep point. doing what we're doing, right. we're going to fail. Well, and that's an important point, because where we ended up, the last work we did was we cannot promise you that degradation stops, 
All we can promise you is it'll take longer to occur and it probably won't be as severe, uh, but the degradation will still occur and we, we don't have an end state for you. What that means when it ends. So it's a roll of the dice. So it's no happy answer there. Yeah, they're just loaded better for you if you've got a protocol that absolutely won't kill the stream dead, for sure. Well, I know I'm stating the obvious here, but I think it's worth observing uh, just in a, in a very <clears throat> general um, overall view of, of the frustration we, hear, we get here. And this discussion right here emphasizes it, I think, and that is that so often <clears throat> what we know will be a benefit to all of us eventually, in fact, is even right now, together, we, we find it very difficult to implement because we're, we're required to prove it on an incremental basis. So we either have to prove what one party is doing is detrimental to a very in a very specific way, or we have to prove that a remedy to that is beneficial in a very specific way. And as we know, on an incremental basis, it's almost impossible. And yet we know what the overall approach should be, but we're stuck. Yeah. Well, I suggested to Department of Ecology. I was on this committee that the last year the Department of Ecology was debating what LID should be. And I suggested to them that if they wanted to still have some kind of a model, a hydrologic model, that told them what deterioration should be that, and apply it at the development services counter, that what they should do is require that the proponent model his development as if it were, uh, as if the entire watershed were developed with that, on that same, st uh, that same protocol, that same uh, pattern. And if the stream went toes up, if the entire watershed was uh, done hard by, like this developer was proposing, then he didn't pass muster. He was asking for something that couldn't be granted to everybody without ruining the stream. Well, that probably would be another court case, but it seems reasonable enough to me that I would hope it would pass. Pass muster. The question of the cumulative Exactly so. Yeah, as Walt said, on an incremental basis, gosh, all I want to do is put down one parking lot. How can that possibly hurt anything? Well, if you built the entire watershed with parking lots like that, it would be toast. So how do you make that connection? How do you connect those dots? Hello, Dave. Tom, do uh, you want to comment on the, the new stormwater center up at Puyallup? Can you kind of explain what they're doing? You know, I don't know much about them, except I think they're the new home for the um, uh, water center that used to be at the university. Is that the same? Well, it's a mix, but, well, anyway, I'll stand up for a second. I'm Dave Dealer with Puget Sound, and what I was asking Tom about is there's actually a relatively new center called the Stormwater Center that's up at the, what used to be known as the PLF uh, WSU Research Center, which mostly research agriculture. Uh, in the last five or ten years, they've moved a lot more into what's uh, called urban research, and they actually have a consortium there that involves uh, researchers from the University of Washington and Washington State University, City of Puyallup and some other local governments that's now funded by the state, uh, parts, parts are funded by the state, to do research on different stormwater low impact development techniques. And so if you ever get a chance to go up there now, you will see that they are trying out different low impact development techniques like, like impervious surfaces, green roofs, different kinds of pavement, pavers, rain gardens, all kinds of things uh, to see how well they work. And part of this is around Lots of ideas have been floating around for about low impact development for a couple of decades around here, but not many of them have actually been tested and monitored in a way that you could say, if you put it in on this kind of a soil, this is the result you're going to get, or with this kind of rainfall. And so, of course, with the researchers from the universities, I mean, that's what they're about is me measurements, right? Putting these things in, measuring how they perform over time. So that looks like a real promising uh, kind of place for research and getting real uh, numbers on how well these things perform when they're put in. And, and certainly the, one of the questions asked earlier I think was around the cost and effectiveness of these and certainly if you're asking people to spend a little bit more money to put in 
certain techniques, you'd like to be assured that they're going to work for you know a certain period of time. Just like I get a 30-year you know warranty on my roof, I expect it to last 30 years, right? You know, so I think when they put in LID techniques, they'd like to know how long they're going to last as well. Yeah, I, I know who you're talking about now. Yeah. Curtis Hinman. Yeah, and WSU has been doing fantastic work the last 10 years, but they're focused on the tools and the tool bag. Yeah. You know, what does previous pavement do for you? What does a rain garden do? What kind of soil is this, that, and the next thing? That's right. They have not focused at, focused at all on what should be the standard for low impact development. And um, they have steered clear of it for the same reason the Department of Ecology has. It's too hot and they want to continue to get funding. So I I don't I'm not dissing them. I think that there there's a place for them, they're doing valuable work, but don't look to them for advice on what kind of standard you should have. Yeah, one thing that uh, the Solid Waste Advisory Committee has kicked around because it's one of the few areas where there's still money in county government, uh, was to have a demonstration uh, project, mostly focused on green building, but also on rain gardens and how to have, how to live well and have a small footprint. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's in its infancy right now, but it's something to, think about and maybe, uh, you know, maybe help out. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, for an example of a place that was actually designed for zero runoff, that McPhee Medical Center on, was it 310 or 510 McPhee Street? Uh, it was in the slide. That's a great place to bring groups to point out that this stuff can work. That, that site was the soil was so bad that the the soil technician on the project said that there is zero infiltration. Once you get past the, the duff and the gravel over the hard pan, it was zero. He could not find any infiltration, yet that project has not discharged any surface water runoff since 2005. And the year that same year it was constructed, they had that real long two-month wet period. Everybody, anybody remember that? It was 60 days. They, they had the wettest 60 days in history. And um, there was no runoff from that site. So, and we were all crossing our fingers because the first year the vegetation hasn't grown up. And yeah, it's a good place to go for um, a show and tell for somebody who wants to be. I mean, people haven't, I think that you're um, a little bit nervous about deviating from the standard house form. And, you know, if you can demonstrate a level of comfort and beauty, then maybe it would create more of a market. Mm -hmm. so, just a little bit. Well, that's what Bob was asking for, too. Yeah, mm -hmm. we need that. Tom, thank you so much. This was really yeah. great. And thank you all for coming. Yes. <coughs>
I'm going to try to get it on YouTube. I think I can. Uh, 